Brain, energy, fuel, there seems to be nothing Russia won't weaponize to achieve its imperialistic and expansionist ambitions. But these, but are all these strategies now failing? Will Russia face a perfect storm of battlefield losses combined with losses in its hybrid economic warfare? Welcome to Silicon Curtain Podcast. Please like and subscribe if you like the content we produce and our fantastic guests. And of course, this will help the popularity of the videos in YouTube. Do also consider becoming a patron or buy me a coffee if you want to support our work. Anastasia Shobochkina is founder and president of Eastern Circles. She has 11 years of experience in consulting and energy industry where she worked on companies, technologies, and market analysis in the renewable energy, utilities, nuclear energy, and e-mobility sectors. She led development of international cross-industry partnerships uh, and research projects on these subjects and represented business in European industrial and research associations. Anastasia is a lecturer on geopolitics in Sciences Po Paris since 2012, focusing on the role of business in the EU-Russia relations. Anastasia is author of articles on the geopolitics and geoeconomics in the former Soviet Union, and she has regular TV and radio appearances. And I should point out, this is our third conversation on the channel. I'm delighted that you're back. We didn't put you off. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be back. And the nice thing about having a third conversation is you know, we, we, we get beyond some of the sort of background questions and we can dive into what's actually happening at the moment. And that's what we're going to do today, because the Russian economy often gets second billing in the media when it compares to, say, you know, battlefield incremental you know changes, etc. Or where we see this sort of huge attack on uh, Crimea. That's what gets into the newspapers. Um, but the slow grinding degradation of the Russian economy does not. So what can we know about the state of the Russian economy at the moment? Mm. I think that here it is important to distinguish between two things. One is communication and one is uh, reality. And here we get two different messages. <clears throat> Uh, we have, uh, and, and this, the two different messages, we have to explore them through the, uh, you know, the backdrop of several months now, uh, almost nine months, uh, how the um, comments about the Russian economy have evolved since the beginning of the year. And we started this year with something that uh, seemed to be very uh, realistic assessment and a surprising, coming from a surprising source, because it was the Russian finance ministry itself, which announced that their revenues from hydrocarbons have fallen by 49% in February compared to uh, the February of previous year, 2022, and in January compared to January of previous year. And that was in March, they announced that. And that was, in, to me, that was surprising in itself that they have announced that, because of course, at this point in Russia, <clears throat> all of the statistics, all of the uh, numbers and the announcements, they are perfectly controlled and are there to project as optimistic picture as possible. So this announcement coming from uh, the Minister of Finance was, was rather surprising in itself, but really reflected to me uh, uh, something that was expected by many analysts, especially energy analysts, as soon as the oil price dropped on the oil markets and as soon as the oil price cap was introduced in addition to the european oil embargo on russian oil that was something uh, to be expected everybody expected that for now uh january february budget ran a deficit uh in russia and uh the expenses on the other hand ran a 50 percent increase compared to the, the previous year so that you know drew us into the very logical understanding of the budget you know, the russian budget uh, is is losing money thanks to sanctions especially especially the oil price cap. Uh, the Russian uh, oil industry kept announcing uh, cuts in production uh, several times since January, the latest in August, and uh, every time uh, these were uh, significant cuts. So we could say, okay, well, then even better, like the, the predictions are, are coming to fruition, both on the impact of sanctions, on the impact of uh, the departing Western companies from Russia, uh, and which are, if you, if anybody wondered who they were replaced with, and I think we addressed this question last time, maybe a little bit, <clears throat> they were not replaced massively by some other 
foreign companies a little bit to a lesser extent, but mostly were replaced with the Russian companies, which by historically have deficiencies in certain areas of exploration, um, especially exploration. And uh, some areas, some uh, parts of the supply chain uh, on the exploration side cannot be really replaced uh, by Russian companies. So that you know, spelled the writing on the wall that indeed there must be production cuts. And then we started seeing production cuts and uh, the, hence we, we were happy kind of, kind, of, kind of getting, okay, like that, that's, that's a picture. Now, um, just before we get into the oil industry, because that gets much more complex from there, uh, just to, 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 to round up on the economy, just a few more numbers, right? It's uh, then in, in response to this, um, you know, if, uh, you know the, the, the disbalance between the budget uh, revenues, uh, especially from hydrocarbons, of course, we remind this is uh, a single most important item in Russian budget, which uh, is estimated uh, to be about 60% of the, of the, of the Russian uh, budget, uh, if we count everything, the, the tax, the revenue from it, the taxes, the taxes of all of the annex taxes, let's say, people who get paid salaries in the sector, they also have to pay taxes. And then the subcontractors have to pay, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this comes up to a big, big number. And <clears throat> The fall in this in this in this revenue kind of and also in, in together with increase with expenses you know, kind of kind of spell this this situation. But then we get to the production and how does the Russian um, government react to this? And the Russian uh, government organ which reacted to this was the central bank. There historically you have a one competent person, uh, not to say that the Minister of Finance, current Minister of Finance, is incompetent, but uh, Elvira Nabulina is a long term. Um, a very long-term uh, senior government official in Russia, and she is considered to be a competent, um, uh, a competent central banker. I would say they should change several positions, and uh, in in this competence, her her most important tool at her expense is monetary policy. So she starts uh, pretty much uh, injecting. You know, she, she starts for, foreign policy. She starts currency interventions by, by the central bank, and basically she starts selling a lot of rubles in exchange for the yuan. And uh, that uh, uh, kind of helps balance out the ruble. Yet, by August, we see ruble crossing this, what kind of is a symbolic psychological tool threshold of 100 rubles per dollar, something that brings us back in memory to at the end of 2014, the first time uh, this is massive sanctions were kind of sanctions were applied to Russia, economic sanctions. And uh, the first time we saw ruble in a really dire situation, especially in December 2014, crossing that mark. And then at some point it went over to 105 uh, 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 rubles per dollar, and so that was, uh, you know, th that of course drew a lot of commentary uh, about the, the state of the Russian economy, and that in itself, right, <clears throat> is a pair, is 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 enough to ask questions about now August Minister of Finance announcements, uh, which announced, for example, six percent inflation in Russia only. Well, if you have any Russians in in, in your surrounding who, who recently went to Russia they would testify that their impression of inflation and they go to the supermarket, for example, is totally different. It's, it's not at all around 6%. It is a, a di totally different category. So uh, these numbers obviously seem surprising. And of course, any economist who comments this, monitor interventions, uh, uh, the, the assesses that this cannot be a long-term strategy. Right? And how come that we having this uh, situation? Because now coming back to the oil and uh, oil industry and, and the impact of the oil sanctions, the oil sanctions have been criticized a lot because the argument goes, uh, Russia has reoriented all of its uh, oil exports, in fact, and now is pretty much what we can sum up as re-exporting oil and petroleum, some petroleum products back to Europe through China and India. So it's reoriented all exports, half the goes to more or less to China, half more or less to India. India has become, for the first time, a major importer of Russian oil. So where is the problem? Russians have completely went over and above the oil embargo. They replaced the uh, Western shipping companies with their own shipping companies. They have created their own fleet of, of, of tankers, which happen to be maybe 25 years old plus often and are <laughs> swimming, but they're still they're still floating and, and they're bringing oil, mm -hmm. no problem. And some, they Greek, have replaced... some Greek gentlemen helped them, uh, I think, acquire Absolutely. a few of they those as well. Yes. yes. 
power help to do that. People were happy to help them do this. Uh, the, the, the traders, the official uh, uh, five uh, trading big uh, um, energy trading companies uh, shied away from Russian, um, from, from Russian oil, and they were replaced very, in very short period with six completely unknown um, traders uh, that um, who were registered, which are registered in India sometimes in uh, the Middle East, and uh, whose uh, headquarters represent nothing but an empty office. <laughs> And, and and this is according to Bloomberg. Right? They're writing a lot about this uh, this spring and early summer. And then uh, insurance question also was solved. You know that they, they 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 found several solutions, including some Chinese insurance, including some insurance by Western companies. Said and then a bazillion solutions which have been tested and retested before with by Iran, by Venezuela, other sanctioned countries on how you can pour Russian oil on other vessels, mix it with other oils in open seas and through other different areas. So all of this and have brought the Russians to solid argument that, uh, and also the fact that the prices have become non-transparent anymore. So we don't know since it's not, it doesn't go through the major international traders, we don't know anymore since about April, how much people do actually pay for uh, Russian oil. So that before we could argue, well, look, uh, cut, uh, oil price cap works because now the Indians are profiteering uh, just from this, the Chinese are very happy to pay around uh, maybe $50 uh, per barrel of Russian oil. But today we don't know. And the Russians start talking that, well, actually they are uh, paying maybe more and it's more complicated. So hence in August, the same Minister of Finance comes out and Mr. Silvanov and announces that in fact, Russian GDP is projected to grow by 2.5% by the end of this year, compensating or, or, or overly compensating the 2.1% uh, 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 percent uh, dip last year, right? And uh, and this, of course, raises a lot of eyebrows, right? Because at the same time, the new oil cut, well, new production cuts are announced. At the same time, any serious energy analysts, including and starting with the Russian energy analysts, who has been in touch with the industry, who talking to the industry, talk to any journalist of the industry, talk to any source and, and, and talk to the industry yourself. And the picture, they're entirely different and it, no, nobody's happy, nobody's relaxed and nobody is optimistic. And, uh, and, and, and you just, and, and then at the same time, ruble is going you know, completely through the floor. So you're wondering, there's a big cognitive dissonance in everything and all of this. So how is this possible that at the same time as ruble is hitting the floor, oil production is being caught and the business is so pessimistic, not only in oil, but actually across all different sectors that have industry. At the same time, Minister Suwanov is so optimistic about the state of the Russian economy and the official inflation is entirely divorced from the, what people are feeling when they go to the supermarket. And the answer to that and the explanation to that is very simple. If you look at the nature of trade between Russia and China and India in the main commodity, the hydrocarbons. And that trade pretty much excluded the exchange in dollars, which is exactly how everything in Russia is um, kind of measured, right? They have the ruble, but it's just like in any country which, which has underdeveloped economy, you have, uh, you, 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 you measure everything in, in dollars, for example. Like if you want to sell an apartment, you're not going to just price it in rubles and sell it purely in rubles because a month later it can have a totally different value then. So you price it in dollars, but then it's become exceedingly difficult in Russia to get hold of the dollars because all of these major economic exchanges are happening now in theory in rubles, but then who needs rubles? So they're happening in rupees, they're happening in yuan, and therefore Russia got an exceeding quantities of yuan, hence the intervention of the central bank selling it and trying to save the ruble in this way. And even worse, because you say exceeding quantities of yuan is bad, but but it's not extraordinarily bad because Russia still buys a lot from China. So the, in terms of the trade balance, it can still maybe balance out the ruble. And then imagine the same exact situation with India. Russia has, by some estimates, about $56 billion worth of rupees sitting in banks in India and in the Middle East and maybe in other places, which it has extraordinarily difficult time to extract and exchange for dollars because the rupee, just like yuan, is a convertible currency. But it is difficult to convert $56 billion. You cannot just go around and uh, exchange points and do it. So how do you do it? So it takes a lot of time. It is very difficult. And it means that a bunch of money is sitting there somewhere they cannot extract. And at the same time, what we're seeing lately is that China and India both are announcing they're going to actually reduce the uh, probably the purchases of Russian oil. So this and isn't there is another complication because I read that the uh, Modi has said that 
the bulk of the holdings in rupees are really non-exchangeable. They have to be spent within the Indian economy. Um, yes, no, it is not a convertible currency, yeah. in other words. It's exactly. It is convertible, but in practice, no. So the Russians are stuck with the money they cannot extract some of it they extracted to, to to the middle east bank etc but it's just it's this money is is hanging out there and hence the logical suite so to say of the announcements that india is going to reduce the maybe the, the purses of russian oil, which is which is then undermining this whole theory that sanctions are useless they've done nothing to the russian economy we've heard a lot of this discourse and I, we and, and and i'd argue and in eastern circles we, we're about to publish a, a report on russia china economic relations <clears throat> And there we just do, you know, we just go over the arguments one by one, showing, leading to the to the to the main conclusion that even you know, thanks to all of these things, replacement of international traders with Russian traders, replacement of normal fleets with rotten fleets, replacement of everything with everything, of Europe with China and India, in the end of the day, what it resulted in, and that was pointed out by 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 by. by it's pointed out by industry, it's pointed out by energy experts as well. What it resulted in is that the Russian um, major energy sellers, like Rosneft, for example, right? Uh, they would try to get to sell out their oil at port at as low price as they can. Because then it's them you know, of course, you know, surprisingly, the owners behind all those new trading companies, new shipping companies, etc., happens to be also often Rosneft or <clears throat> other Russian companies, Luke Oil, and other as a few few big big majors. And these people then try: how do they make the margin if their top price is kept through sanctions? Well, they get and and in what, no matter what they would say, most likely the Indians and the Chinese are not overpaying entirely on the cap price. So they would then try to squeeze the margin by selling their own oil at as low price as possible at port. So then, whatever the margin is, is increased by the by the by the floor and not by the ceiling, since the ceiling you cannot move. What does it mean? It means that this price, whatever is sold for at port, is going then. Is going to be whatever taxed uh, in some of it is going to be returning to to the budget but the margin is gone and the margin is going to be lending in in eventually right either in an indian account in rupees or uh, just uh, completely disappearing in some other account of, of, of the of the owners of these oil companies and eventually uh settling into their pockets a lot as well and everything that's let's say rosneft in india right for example rosneft in india owns half of a major Indian uh, refinery, there are five big refineries in India, half of one of them is 50, almost 50% owned by Rosneft. Well, that money is made in India, and as you say, right, and logically also by, by juridical structures, it's gonna stay in India, so therefore it's not returning to Russia. And anything that's not returning to Russia is the proof that the sanctions have been effective. Aside from all of this macroeconomic picture we've just painted, Mm -hmm. And then we have this macroeconomic picture we've just painted, but then we get to the main argument. When you listen to the official communication, which is going to tell you by the mouth of Minister Silvano how the Russian economy and GDP is going to grow by 2.5%, how the situation is under control, inflation is at 6%, targeting 4% soon, you have to take it with a grain of salt. And of course, they always have low unemployment rates. <laughs> Like, there is no surprise in that with seeing the rate of people beating it from Russia and those who cannot, you know, also being recruited and sent into the into the trenches. That also obviously creates very low unemployment rates. That is one official statistics I'm very eager to believe, actually. Mm -hmm. Low unemployment rates. <laughs> but that, that I can actually believe as well. I mean, not everybody in the economy is, uh, I would say, skilled or tooled up to do sort of senior jobs, but... Even anecdotally, I know of somebody uh, who I'd previously met, so not a friend, uh, a colleague, or really just a, just a passing acquaintance, and I happened to sort of follow their um, uh, their Facebook feed. And this is this is a senior executive in Moscow, um, who many of his colleagues would have probably not been drafted because this is Moscow; they would have left the country. And the rumor is that, you know, his salary has doubled um, in the last year. And you're talking about something who's very senior, uh, actually within a Western-owned company that's still operating. Well, we'll come to that in a minute, 
because that's another horrific aspect to what is keeping Russia afloat. Um, but I can well believe that not only have people got plenty to do, they're actually being paid considerably more than they were a year ago. But as you point out, they might have a lot less things to spend it on. And those things might be costing an awful lot more in the shops where they are available. And and with the with the oil industry, just uh, I forgot two, two very important things to mention. One is that of course anything that's the price of oil, and today even you know the market like uh, basically the, uh, the 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 price cap is is at sixty dollars a barrel. Would remind yeah, just just in case people forgotten, the latest Russian budget was at seventy dollars a barrel. So even that very simple calculation gives you gives you an idea. Uh, on the so on the uh, demand side though. Another very curious phenomenon which happened in August in Russia. Across Russia, you saw patrol stations running law on patrol in Russia. And the reason is, of course, that as maybe, you know, the, the price, old price cap, you know, kept the, the price abroad, that you can sell abroad. But home prices are even lower. And hence, everything possible was pushed abroad. Also, uh, with the considerations of the margins we have just mentioned, right, as fast as possible, because, of course, the business is reacting to the, also the volatility of the situation at home and to know how it's going to end and when and, and, and what can happen. But as a result, the home market was left with a dearth of supply and demand remaining the same. So, in, 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 and even growing as it's vacation season. So, across Russia, in multiple, multiple regions, that was something that was really commented by the Russian news. And this reflects nothing but unwillingness. Also, this deprioritization, obviously, of Russian domestic consumer with no surprise because the, the prices, they are even lower. And the companies are trying to squeeze out as much margin as they can just to even keep afloat because the production cuts, even though they are the official explanation is, is to influence the prices within the OPEC plus, et cetera, we can also suspect that production cuts may have to do with the production itself. Once you have a senior major... Uh, several major uh, Western companies departing. Uh, the production rates, according to uh, uh, the numerous energy analysts, cannot be sustained at the same uh, rate without the technology, without the master of the technology, and then in the long run also with new exploration and production um, in, in, the, in the fields. Yeah. And with that sort of dearth of... Um fuel locally and i've read a story here and most people will be thinking oh well private individuals are being affected they can't drive their cars to work etc but actually there are very rich public transport networks across most of russia so that's less of an issue isn't it the real issue is going to be rural communities and farmers if you can't get diesel to run your tractor if you can't get diesel to run your equipment and generators that is going to have a significant impact on the agricultural economy which of course you know, is one of the few things that 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 that, that uh, does generate some income and generates important produce to keep Russia afloat. You know, if the food runs out, that's when the protests really going to start. If the fuel and the food runs out, then Putin's got problems. Yeah, there I agree with you with this one uh, conclusion that the only way the Russians can may be brought to care about anything, and we are now talking about the population, of course, at large, which. According to polls, according to just uh, a lot of the Russian population doesn't care about the war. That which is not affected by the war, of course, in Moscow, the situation is you know, kept as stable as they can, together with about uh, 2 million um, uh, people from the Siloviki establishment, which are just there in Moscow to make sure the situation is kept under control and doesn't get out of control. Uh, but um, uh, but, but I would say that uh, the, uh, uh, this, the, the the point when we would get into the hungry territory, I think the Russian Russia is very far from it. And that's the pessimistic kind of conclusion that I'm drawing from this. Yes, we can explain how sanctions may be effective in hitting Russian economy at large. But to get the Russians to the Russian society, if we want to believe in this is going to be the lever that's going to move the, the, the power and, 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 the, and the decisions in the Kremlin, which, which is also and very arguable as a position. Uh, to move the Russian society, you do need to bring it to the brink of hunger. To bring to the brink of hunger, it, we are not there at all. I, I would argue that we are there at all. 
despite the gaps, of course, and which you noted, between the rich and the poor in Russia, and the poor, they're numerous, and they're much more numerous than the rich, the middle class has been very much squeezed by the situation, and uh, the business suffers across the board, and of course, uh, like the, 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 there are consequences for not for the top management, as you, as you mentioned, top management actually can be rewarded for staying in place. But uh, the uh, people who are on the bottom, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that the salaries of, of workers have doubled, tripled and quadrupled mm -hmm. over the same period. And of course, uh, that pain is felt. I would say that, um, yes, public transportation, but what cities, what towns are we talking about since uh, there are only... Uh, you know, about 17 big cities in Russia, like um, around a million people uh, or, or so. And uh, then uh, everything else is less. And uh, a lot of cities are very far removed from Moscow. So maybe when we think about public transportation, maybe we think Moscow, right? Or St. Petersburg. But um, I, I don't, I, I think that reliance on a car in Russia, just like in any uh, Western town you know uh, is 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 very high and mm. and not having patrol also for trucks right also for logistics uh that that's that's a that it shows you a bigger picture it also shows you that uh yeah the the priorities of the government are uh, are elsewhere and uh most importantly i think that just to, to bring to, to the population right it's, it's what is the, what is it as a lever on the Kremlin's decisions I would argue that it isn't a high lever. Maybe it isn't much of a lever. I don't know how much the Kremlin is. And and maybe, again, I'm not an expert in Russian internal politics, and maybe the experts would disagree with this. Uh, but at this point, Russia has such a massive oppressive apparatus that uh, it is difficult to imagine, again, outside of massive, massive uprisings so hold the country and, and the revolution that 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 it's difficult to imagine the population can make its voice count. Every every election is is absolutely managed and 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 it's absolutely predictable. Now, what can maybe play a role, of course, and this has been uh, a lot has been of it has been discussed is oh, what about the elite putsch and all this? And we saw obviously in, in June, right, the attempt of that. Uh, and uh, my bet is that the one outcome of Prigozhin's at, uh, uh, kind of attempted coup or, or however you call it, is that now uh, the attention of the Russian leader is must definitely be turned around the question of who are the traitors surrounding him? Because Prigozhin himself wasn't the most prominent member of the Russian elites. And there were prominent members of the Russian elites behind him who were um, you know, often in intermediaries between him and Putin, like talking about the the, the business and and basically endorsing him, and uh, those people like like Yuri Kabachuk, even like Iga Sitchin, who who was also uh, one of the you know more distant supporters, uh, they my expectation would be that they they should also come under suspicion, uh, because of course people like Putin, I don't think they would believe that uh, who only thinks about you know the the, the the great powers, the great leaders. I don't think that they would believe that Prigozhin himself alone uh, could uh, dare such a fit. And that in itself is a is a is a more important factor than any economic factor we can think about. The delusion of attention from maybe the war in Ukraine, not which is not a priority anymore. I would argue should not be a priority anymore for the Kremlin. The priority should be now hunting down the traitors. And again. The, the 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 unfortunate accident uh, of Prigozhin and Utkin, uh, the uh, also removal of Surabikin and uh, uh, the other other actors which are less important, uh, are indicators that there is a uh, kind of hunt which hunt which has started, and I hope that which hunt can preoccupy a lot of the attention and thus dilute the attention from the war. And uh, you know, one can hope as well that if there is anybody with any competence. Uh, in the military hierarchy um, and even the civilian hierarchy. You talked about the uh, Russian central banker. I mean, hopefully competent people will be taken out or forced out uh, in this wave of, of paranoia as well. Mm. Um, we, we we have no idea. I mean, it's rumoured that uh, Nabulina was, was, was roundly told that her family would uh, have issues if she left the country or wanted yes. to quit her job. So, mm -hmm. I know and she did want to a... quit the job. She did yeah. want early yeah. on, before even the full scale invasion. Yeah, she yeah. obviously saw what's come, what was coming. But yeah, these people they don't have a choice. I think I have a worse. Uh... 
I would have a worse feeling. I would I would say that people like Nabiulina who are uh, or other technocrats, right, who understand what they're doing, but they are very much removed from the levers of power, uh, the levers of oh they're not part of the Putin oligarchy, let's say. Uh, they would actually be kept by force like Nabiulina rather than. Uh, possibly is kept, uh, possibly not, uh, rather than uh, removed. Um, and, and I mean, incompetence may reign for many, many years. So the Soviet Union is an example. <laughs> you, you had uh, the, the, the centralized economy, which was uh, specifically run by inertia for the last years of its, of its life, uh, and uh, which is a proof that competence is not the only, unfortunately, the only uh, variable that, that ne is needed to run to keep a state afloat. Yeah. And uh, one quick question uh, following on from the sort of rupee um, sort of China currency yuan uh, issue there. China does have uh, equipment and material which Russia needs. It has components as well, which is obviously going to the production of armaments. Are we saying here that, that, that uh, India likely has very little that is of direct use in terms of exports to Russia. So that's a real problem. But also looking at China, do we know the scale of the exports uh, to Russia? And do we know how much you know, military equipment or components, um, what the movement of that is and whether that's scaled up over this period? Mm -hmm. So um, just to say that, of course, all that uh, has to be understood within the against the backdrop of Russia-China military cooperation, which has been growing since 2015, and uh, both in terms of high-level meetings, uh, strategic consultations, um, joint exercises, military exercises, up to the point of having about one meeting uh, within the high-level military uh, rank. Uh, every two weeks by the end of 2021. Now, after that, China has had a, a we can, what we can call a vacillating um, position vis-a-vis -vis the war in the Russian invasion in Ukraine. <clears throat> uh, first, its official propaganda aligned perfectly with the Russian official propaganda about the war. So for China, it's NATO, which uh, invade, started the war. Uh, then it's it hasn't happened to be it hasn't shown itself to be as big of a partner economically as Russia would have expected, and at the same time took advantage entirely, of course, of the Russian need to reorient its oil exports toward China. China has not shown itself one area where we know it hasn't shown itself as a big reliable economic partner, for example, is natural gas. Russia has been dreaming for a second natural gas direct pipeline to China for many, many years, and the Chinese have never shown any desire to finance it, especially now that this is especially needed, and they, 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 they're not likely to, to show this desire in the future, seeing that how unreliable Russia is. The Belt and Road Initiative, the Chinese have announced last year that Maybe Russia is not going to be part of it immediately. Then we'll see later. So all of these things. And then, of course, Russia was counting, just like it did in 2014, when it's immediately after the first invasion of Ukraine announced the pivot uh, to Asia. Again, this old rhetoric from 2010 resurfaced and got really loud. And uh, they hoped again this uh, last year that the Chinese are going to provide them credit, for example, right? A lot of it. And that didn't happen. Uh, or if it happened, it was on the conditions which were not favorable at all. So again and again, China is not proving to be as close of a friend as Russia would like to, but it does prove to be an ally which knows how to use Russia and uh, make it first an uh, energy appendix to itself or a resource appendix, but also more importantly, geopolitically to use it. And there, here's the whole kind of question. Of course, uh, in terms of overall experts, and we have to see this here because it's going to be interesting to see this. It is... <clears throat> have uh, increased in all industries because when we say ex uh, foreign exports diminished to Russia, they were replaced and they are being replaced by Chinese exports in every single industry. Now, the quality and the, the Russians have a historically very uh, skeptical really, uh, attitude toward Chinese technology is known to be lower quality for the Russians uh, than the Western technology and uh, not uh, every time directly substitutable. But... Um, uh, but there, they, they don't have a choice, and this is going on. Now, within this exchange of technology, is a lot of technology is dual use. So you can use it for military and for non-military purposes. There, there's a possibility that the Chinese are shipping 
for example, semiconductors, because it can be shipped in a huge number of civilian objects, which have nothing to do with military or which have dual use objects. So that can be happening. But to estimate the amount of this is pretty much nearly impossible, right? Because even within a, a washing machine, you can, you can ship a semiconductor today, pretty much. Then in terms of direct shipment of weapons, the Chinese have always denied it. But since the very first months of war, and up until as soon as, as late as this week, <clears throat> we have seen, as recently as this week, we have seen the rapprochement between China and North Korea. So now Putin has plenty of photo ops with Kim Jong-un. Uh, he's, uh, he's worthy equal at this point in international relations. And uh, North Korea as an independent uh, actor and weapons seller is something new. In, in the recent history. And of course, knowing the North Korean dependence on China in particular, we may suppose that Kim Jong-un is not entirely independent decision maker in geopolitics, uh, that uh, he is, uh, is a vassal of China pretty much is, is incapable of, is, is not going to be allowed to make any decision yeah. himself. So when we see this rapprochement and our immediate since the beginning of the, of the full-scale invasion and ongoing and lasting, which is now going to be really entrenched and long-term maybe agreements and things, then we may suppose that the, that North Korea is being used by China for doing exactly that, for export of weapons. That would be my humble bet uh, on the export of weapons. I don't think China would officially export weapons on its own, albeit it does continue things like military exercises and dialogue with Russia, etc. But it wouldn't go as far as to um, you know, set itself up for uh, any, any international targeting. And then, of course, there is signaling. So this is one signal. In North Korea is not just signaling, it's beyond signaling. It's really just opera operational you know, decisions and, and solutions that, uh, that we can suppose it's China who's hell is bringing to Russia. But also we have the signaling in pure form, and that is, of course, G20. A purely useless organization. I mean, not, not like it's creating anything of, of importance, but for sending us signals, which are important, extraordinarily important. And this latest signal that we have all received uh, since the latest uh, G20 meeting, I find very powerful. For the first time, we have Russia and China absolutely synced uh, you know, in non-appearance and at the same time, and uh, uh, very... Um, you know, the timing is, is well chosen and uh, and the, the message is understood. I think that, that basically that there is a certain amount of rapprochement, strategic rapprochement, uh, which economic uh, cooperation uh, being what it is, and uh, of course we can say China, Russia is disadvantaged in this cooperation, etc. But we can see we can now see that maybe the signal that we receive at least is that maybe China is actually announcing its colors and is taking side because as the longer the war lasts and the deeper we go into it, the less it possible it becomes to not take a side for anybody. Uh, and more embarrassing if you lose. I mean, that's the other aspect of it. You're more invested. Absolutely, absolutely. And China is, uh, it looks like it, it, is, it is taking sides uh, without exposing itself directly, but taking sides. And for me, North Korea, Russia cooperation is nothing but... Uh, the Chinese decision to help Russia, including militarily. Now that's that's uh, deeply disturbing, but it it, it follows uh, quite a number of reports. You know, we get from people on the front um, in southern and eastern Ukraine that suddenly, over the last couple of months, Russians who were poorly equipped. I mean, they may still have very poor strategy, but extremely poorly equipped. Suddenly, huge numbers of uniforms night scopes drones are appearing mm -hmm. on the battlefield now ukraine is very innovative in taking countermeasures but clearly it's made things a lot more difficult um and russia is not machining these uh parts themselves they're clearly coming in and that's no longer just components these have to be you know um imported as completed items um on that question, though, it's an interesting one, I think. Uh, so whereas you have components, material, you have consumer goods replacing, um, you know, the, uh, the the Western goods that have disappeared, not disappeared entirely. That would be my last question would be about Western companies. Um, when we come to the longer term 
uh, needs. Things like oil exploration equipment, machine tools, um, these sort of longer term cycles where when equipment breaks down, it can have a significant impact on a variety of sectors and industries. And indeed, we saw we saw an Airbus landing in the field this week because of multiple uh, equipment failures. Apparently, three sort of safety systems must have of have have really given way for for that situation to arise so it does suggest that in the in the longer term russia is going to have a huge problem in the sort of industrial machinery and equipment it needs for manufacturing oil exploration and of course aviation and, and so on Indeed, we have seen already, especially in aviation, is of course the most screaming example of of this um, failure uh, along the value chain of the Russian companies to replace Western companies uh, which have left. Uh, especially in aviation, we have seen the cannibalization of uh, the Russian uh, civil aviation fleet uh, um, immediately in the weeks following the full scale invasion. Uh, they first nationalized the uh, basically confiscated the, the 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 remaining planes of Western companies which have left and then they started using them to uh to repair the the other planes so that, that that's the cannibalization of the fleet and that of course is just an an indicator a small sign of a, this overarching problem which stretches across industries and uh, which is costly for russia including by the way in the military industry right um the uh, um We've just uh, finished a study on Russian-India military industrial cooperation, which we're going to publish soon. And uh, there, we have what we have seen, first of all, our exchange with people in aviation industry in general, uh, and brought us to understanding that the Russian aviation standards, and we have seen this through multiple uh, uh, plane accidents in Russia and outside with Russian planes, uh, they are much lower than the Western standards and uh, maybe... Uh, uh, so definitely, definitely not 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 an equal. Uh, and even from that low point, uh, now uh, the uh, so the 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 inability of the Russians to provide um, the uh, operation maintenance services, to provide spare parts, and uh, to to be to be present after the sale of the equipment, they lead obviously to people refusing the purchases of Russian equipment. This is true also for military equipment, which is one of the main export articles of Russia for high tech exports together with uh, uh, together with the nuclear energy, for example, nuclear uh, equipment, nuclear technologies uh, and space and uh, uh, defense. Uh, mar one of the biggest defense markets for Russia uh, historically has been India in this in this recent history. And um, since 2014, for different reasons, not related necessarily directly to Ukraine, but for different reasons, the Russians have already been losing uh, the, in the defense market. They, they lost as, as much as 30% of their, of their market there. But uh, in uh, uh, in this, uh, since the full-scale full invasion, it has become even more exceedingly difficult for the Indians to uh, to, to, to contract to make some new contracts because simply how are these maintenance and operation services going to be ensured and who's going to replace per parts and this there are no answers to these questions and hence uh, we can expect Russia to lose these markets across the board and then a uh, second result of this also for the defense industry as well is that we may expect to see Russia, Russia's role decline as a defense exporter, especially uh, due to the trend of Russia needing desperately new equipment, uh, seeing the level of destruction of existing equipment, and actually becoming a major defense importer, even from Africa, where it's negotiating to re-import its own weapons that it had sold before, even during the Soviet Union. So this is something that is absolutely absolutely crucial the, the problem you're naming it's also crucial for the for the defense industry absolutely there uh, on the replacement part uh, the russians are always saying for any industry that they're going to replace uh, it's going to be home, home substitution at its school uh, they're going to replace everything no problem <laughs> being oil drilling equipment oil exploration production be it uh naval uh, construction industry, be it even, I think, chip manufacturing. We're going to soon hear about Russian chips. I, I would not be very surprised. Uh, uh, say nothing about artificial intelligence and other high-tech industries where Russians are working hard. Now, just to say that uh, all that be good, I think that obviously what we're seeing and what people are seeing in the industry that it's replaced with the Chinese technology and I think that in any aspect in any any industry and that is we can we can increase we can see I think an increasing we can be prepared to see increasing trend of that which brings us geopolitically to the 
uh, as a popularization of Russian uh, skill and know-how in technology, popularization of Russian technical kind of capacity. Uh, in the long run, uh, obviously, industry, industrial capacity will be undermined, and this substitution will make Russia even more dependent on China than it already is in this last year and a half has become, and not just for natural resources exports, and thus for the money for its uh, budget, but also for the uh, for the um, equipment imports and that is of course the whole like industry the whole industrial and economic solidity so to say so definitely an important trend and just one last trend we haven't mentioned today but i would like to underline is uh the uh, natural gas sales of course we, we mentioned oil and and that's uh, and that's subject to many factors like oil price and then what are these contracts uh, and etc we never know how much money really coming to the russian um to the russian budget etc on natural gas the situation is much more clear we have to say that uh, 80 percent about 80 percent of revenue has been lost right uh the substitution is not possible of european markets with asia markets because uh, of simple restrictions of uh, export capacity uh through infrastructure there is only one pipeline exporting russian gas to china and that's 38 billion cubic meters a year maximum not all of the capacity is used by far and that cannot replace 160 billion cubic meters a year exports to europe for example lng exports are increasing uh by russia both to asia and to europe and there has not been any sanction on Russian gas. And the trend we're seeing, and that's an important and disturbing to me trend, is because of course the Russians are desperate to restore that export. In, in, and they, since they cannot do it in Asia, they are redoing it in Europe. And how they're doing it, and now the Russians are negotiating to for the Russian gas to be accepted on the joint purchasing mechanism of the European Commission that the European Commission initially uh, created to negotiate lower prices with all gas providers. So if Russian gas is accepted in any shape and form, we can return, we can expect the return to business as usual and this being the first stepping stone. And then we've seen the LNG exports to Europe go up by 50% last year, including through China. Uh, for example, the French uh, purchases of LNG come from China. And that, of course, raised a lot of eyebrows. I think people read in the news uh, one day in the French newspapers that uh, France is buying LNG from China. And people were like, oh, really? Even if you don't know, if you, you know nothing about energy sector, you were quite surprised to learn uh, in the morning news that China is selling LNG. You've never heard of it. And that is very easily explained if you look at who are the shareholders of the two Russian major LNG projects, Yamal LNG and Arctic LNG2, and these are Chinese companies which own between 20 and 30 percent of each. And uh, that, of course, explains why China can sell LNG. And that's it's basically Russian, it's basically Russian gas. That's Russian being... LNG. Yeah, being passed and, through. And, yeah. and Russia can also sell its own LNG since there have never been sanctions on, on gas. And hence now, I think it's an important thing to watch is what is going to be this development with the joint purchasing mechanism if Russians are going to be able to come back to it. And just the pure, and, and then they, of course, this all in the light of the recent announcements by Commissioner Shevkovich that the European Union actually cannot, absolutely cannot survive without the Russian gas, which goes kind of flies in the face of everything we've observed the last year and a half. So all of these things being said, uh, this is something to watch for me in the energy sector, is how the Russians are trying to wind back uh, the uh, punishments they have actually inflicted upon themselves by cutting off experts of uh, their own gas to European Union, and uh, how the European Union is going to now um, cede or not to Russian lobbying, which I'm sure has been relentless in the last um, in the last months. And not only does it sound like you know sanctions are a very leaky sieve, um, you could always perhaps put a, a little label on this, which is uh, you know Western hypocrisy, because not only do you have these multiple mechanisms by which Russia can continue to generate revenue from its hydrocarbons, you also have a significant number of multinational Western companies still operating either directly or through proxies or holding companies or joint ventures partners in Russia. Um, two of the biggest, uh, PepsiCo, Unilever, uh, the Financial Times recently published a list of many dozens of the largest ones. But beyond that, there are many hundreds of mid-sized ones 
um, still happily manufacturing. One of the excuses that Unilever gives is that uh, it's looking after its staff. It can't abandon its staff in Russia. What a great humanitarian gesture that is. At the same time, they're giving the details of their staff to Russian recruitment offices so they can be sent as cannon fodder to the front lines. Extremely humanitarian. Um, what, what is your take on this extraordinary Western hypocrisy? Well, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. This uh, These excuses are pure bullshit uh, because precisely uh, of, of the reason that you just named, every single company that stays in Russia today has been showing the miracles of flexibility and cooperation with the authorities on every single question from the payment to the uh, giving out their staff uh, to et cetera, et cetera. But um, uh, and of course, it is important to have in mind the number. It is important to have in mind that, that each of these companies pays taxes. And then, uh, uh, and then uh, the, the, these are just two you named, which have been recently in, in the news, but there, there are many others. And I would just turn to, and again, come back to the kind of my comfort zone, which is the energy sector. And also for the reason, for the simple reason that that's where it is the most important. The presence of these companies, foreign companies, is the most important in the oil and gas sector. And there we have two companies I'd like to single out. And those are uh, Technip and Schlumberger. Schlumberger went as far as to change its name to SLB uh, earlier in 2022. <clears throat> Just to uh, be, be, be kind of remain in Russia uh, and and at the same time not not to entirely review its brand in the rest of the world, and these are uh, oil and gas engineering companies. So they are uh, not subject to uh, mass market moves. For example, you say PepsiCo. Let's say we can imagine if the consumers all over the world are not indifferent toward uh, the war, which is necessarily the case, uh, they could, let's say, ban some PepsiCo products. But it is impossible for consumers, mass consumers, to ban uh, Schlumberger or Technique services, for example. They, they are irrelevant. Mass consumers are irrelevant for the services. And so these companies, they can, therefore, afford uh, to stay there. For, for Even for companies like Total or Shell or you know, BP, there is still a brand damage uh, uh, that can be uh, inflicted uh, and just can, just it's not pleasant because their logos are all over the patrol stations all over the world. But Schlumberger and Technique no. And they are in Russia, they remain in Russia, uh, about a 25-30% of Technip's uh, uh, business pipeline comes from Russia. There is no reason. We, we are talking about billions and billions of dollars and long-term contracts, and they are helping the Russian capacity to produce oil, uh, to stay afloat and uh, uh as as long as they stay that they can support not say absolutely and sure but definitely support the longevity of the russian oil, and, oil, oil, oil industry and hydrocarbons industry which is the heart and the and the backbone of its economy so i would just just underline this too of course but you're right there are hundreds of others that that, that are that are very publicized and yeah to, to sort of conclude that point as well i mean that revenue isn't just going to support people's wages it is going to uh create munitions uh you know kinjar missiles etc the output of however many dozens of, of missiles etc are produced a month uh you know um ammunition artillery shells etc it's all it's all going on this and of course to import uh the material of of death from uh from other countries too um it was an extraordinary uh, sort of dive into the situation. Um, there's so much to unpack. I think I'll definitely have to print out a transcript and go through it with a highlighter to really <laughs> understand the incredible amount of insight and information you've you've conveyed to us. I know that the last two videos were incredibly well received, and your expertise. You know, people are uh, amazed by the sheer scale of of your expertise uh, into what's going on. I know they'll Thanks. love this. And I very much appreciate um, you spending the time uh, this morning Thank to, you so much to talk to us. Thank for you for inviting. Thank you. Brilliant. Right. I'll